Welcome to episode 17 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined in virtual studio by my good friend, my constant texting dialogue partner, and the man who brings the excitement to the NFL draft, the one, the only... <laughs> John Sloat. I don't know how I do that, but thank you, Matt. Good to see you this morning. Well, with the NFL draft, <laughs> I, my interest is largely just in Ohio State players, where they're going. And, uh, and I, I enjoy your commentary on the fate of the Jets and their, and their uh, choices. So, Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, the, the fate's not good. Usually, usually. But we'll, we'll get into that uh, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So before we do that, though, we do want to extend a special thank you. We, we have uh, been bemoaning the fact that we haven't had any reviews lately of the podcast. And so two listeners stepped up to the plate and provided some helpful uh, reviews. And so we're grateful for their, for their time. Yeah, very grateful. And one of them apparently lived uh, in my building when I was a resident director at Grace. I just... I can't place them. I don't know who they are. So I'm, thank you. Excited to have you listening. Yeah. And we've also expanded the scope of our listeners. We're, we're picking up new countries now, right? Yeah. Yeah. We've got some odd countries. Norway, I think, jumped in there. Slovenia. Yeah. Um, uh, Uruguay. A, yeah. You, Uruguay, we, we, all, we've, we've made it to South America, John. Yeah. Um, although I, I think I know, I think I know a, a missionary there. So Okay. That that may be him, uh, but uh, but we'll see. Ireland, we picked up Ireland as well. Picked up Ireland. Where we've got a couple in the UK, uh, the Philippines. We had one download from the Philippines. So yeah. things are things are things are growing. It's all part of our plan for global domination. And as part of that plan for global domination, we started a Facebook page last week. Yeah, and that that really took off. I think we were surprised at yeah. uh, at how well that did. So. Something around uh, 275 likes in under a week, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, and if, if that's not you out there listening, go to the Facebook page. You can, you can find it uh, by typing in Various and Sundry Podcasts on Facebook. Like, follow, leave a comment, leave a review on Facebook, leave a review on Apple. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. And we've been talking about some different uh, ways we can be uh, pushing out content on the, uh, on the Facebook page. So, uh, be looking for that in the next few weeks as we brainstorm and, 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 and make our plans. And of course, uh, you're welcome to, uh, connect with us on Twitter at V and S pod, and you can email the show various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. So, uh, John, as I mentioned, uh, in our opening line there, we had the NFL draft this past weekend. And so we should start with what are your thoughts on the NFL draft? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I thought the draft was a lot of fun. Uh, I think it got killer ratings uh, because, you know, there's just not a whole lot of sports on right now. Uh, but, uh, but I, I thought the NFL did a good job. It was, it was fun to see. There, there were a few things that I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed that the commissioner, allowed himself to be booed so he encouraged fans to boo him over zoom uh, yeah. which was uh pretty pretty fun to watch and something he could lean into <laughs> um i heard yes. some sports commentators say they wanted his family to come into the living room or into his basement to boo him uh to make it a bit more a bit more live but uh but enjoyed that so i thought he had a good time and i think they raised money with with bud light through that um, yeah for uh covid relief and then, uh, and then I enjoyed seeing uh, the the GMs and coaches in their homes with their kids. Like that was just a lot of fun to see uh, them. And uh, like the Jets, uh, the Jets GM, my team, the Jets. Uh, his daughter was wearing a was wearing a Jets cheerleading outfit and was was like doing cheers in the background <laughs> during during things. And I saw it all over the Twitter feed. It was it was a lot of fun. So I, I think it was one of the more low key, not so many bells and whistles drafts we've had in a long time. Yeah. So how do you feel about uh, your Jets? I, I'm not even aware of necessarily who they, I know they, they picked up an offensive lineman, was it? Yeah. The first line is just yes. apparently uh, just a massive human being. Yeah, he, he might be the biggest human I've ever seen. Uh, so he's like 
six foot five, 350 pounds, um, and runs a, runs a five, one, maybe 40. I mean, just, just way too fast for that big a man. Uh, and, uh, and, um, the other thing I loved about the draft is they had like the ridiculous, the most ridiculous random facts that went along with each athlete. Yeah. And so this, this guy's was four year starter at Louisville, uh, 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 350 pounds, mom's a caterer, uh, love soul food. You know, that, that, that was sort of like, like all the random, all the random facts, uh, uh about the, the individuals is great. So he was yeah. our first round draft pick, um, huge upside, a couple risks. He failed a drug test a while back. Uh, but, uh, we'll, we'll see. And the draft really feels like one of those things where I go, goodness, I'll let you know how it went in three years. You know, yeah, I, I always find we'll it see how some of these guys pan out that uh, you get these you know, these sort of definitive, confident grades for each team at this point. When good grief, I mean, I think maybe there are some situations where you're like, well, I think it's pretty clear which teams had good drafts and bad drafts at some level, but you know, you got to wait two, three years, I think, before you can look back and go. How did people pan out? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure people uh, didn't give the Patriots uh, a super high grade when they drafted Tom Brady in the sixth round. It wasn't like, oh, this is a game changer. That means it's an yeah. A, you know. And he ends up, you know, unfortunately being arguably the greatest quarterback in NFL history. So, yeah, and I, I do like that we took we took two or three offensive linemen in the draft, which I'm always a big fan of. Like I always feel like. Those are high percentage picks. They often work out. And you, if you, you can pick tackles and centers. Tackles can always move to guards, um, and centers are always huge building blocks for you. So I, I would, I'm always pleased with, pleased when we draft offensive linemen. Yeah. Well, my interest always tends to be more in the um, in the realm of Ohio State players, and um, it's obviously. Uh, good for recruiting when there's a large number of Ohio State players being taken off the board. And this year, um, they ended up um, setting a couple different uh, marks in terms of uh, the first was that they had the top three players taken in the draft on their roster at Ohio State at one point. So, so Joe Burrow was a quarterback at Ohio State and transferred to uh, uh, LSU, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. And then Chase Young. Chase Young. Uh, yep. Defensive end went to the Redskins. And then Jeff Okuda, um, the cornerback. Uh, cornerback who went to the Lions. So, uh, and then Ohio State, <clears throat> Ohio State had another first round draft pick. Uh, Damon Arnett at number 19 went to the Raiders, uh, which some have thought maybe is a reach, but um, I think it just reinforces the um, fact that Ohio State uh, is an NFL factory at this stage. I think they had a total of 10 guys drafted. And here's your, here's your steal of, uh, of the draft from, uh, from, from a Ohio State perspective. In the seventh round, K.J. Hill, wide receiver out of Ohio State, went to the, uh, to the Chargers. Okay. And uh, he is the all-time leading uh, receptions uh, hmm. guy at Ohio State. And apparently the knock on him was, well, where they were concerned because he doesn't have top-end speed, um, that he wasn't going to get open in the NFL. And a bunch of Ohio State coaches came out and said, um, you know, he went against first-round draft picks at corner every single day in practice and got open plenty. So he'll be fine. So we'll see. Yeah. It could be a steal at that point. And it was a very deep draft for wide receivers as well. So there, there were a lot that were available. Yeah. So anyway, um, we should move on to our next topic, uh, which is also in the sports realm, something that yeah. you and I have been uh, looking forward to when it was announced that it, this was coming out. But this was week two of the Last Dance, the ESPN documentary series on the 97-98 uh, Chicago Bulls team, but it's about much more than that in the sense that they give a ton of backstory to that team. So it's not just about that championship yeah. season. 
So we watched episodes three and four came out this Sunday. Yep. Episode three focused mostly on Dennis Rodman. Yeah. Um, who is a fascinating character. Yeah, he is. He is absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we throw this term around way too much, but he is a unique human being. He really is. Yeah. And um, he's only gotten more unique since leaving the NBA. Uh, so, I mean, he's, he's flying to North Korea and playing basketball with the leader there, right? He was on, uh, I remember watching him on The Apprentice. Um, so he's good friends with Donald Trump and King, Kim Jong-un, right? So they're, they're, that's a unique person. Um, always has a different hair color. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a fascinating person. Any, anything stand out to you about him in, in, that, uh, in that third episode? Well, I think that for me, since um, ESPN had done a 30 for 30 on Dennis Rodman. Hmm. And so having watched that, um, you know, you had a pretty good idea of, of what he, what he was like from that. Um, I think the, the extent to which uh, the Chicago Bulls made the sort of calculation of we're willing to put up with a lot, a lot of his, uh, baggage because on the floor when he's dialed in he's the best at what he does in terms of defense and rebounding that and that was a piece that they needed so yeah I, I was struck I, they, by that they threw up a piece of trivia I watched it so I've been watching the documentary on the ESPN uh, app um, just next day mm -hmm. and uh, and one of the things they threw up is they threw up trivia and they said uh, he had, he had, I think it was seven games in his career where he had 20 rebounds and zero points. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they said the next closest is Marcus Camby with two. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Which, which is insane. That's just yeah. crazy. Yeah. Um, I think one of the more spectacular things, maybe spectacular is the wrong word. Uh, fascinating, maybe fascinating was <laughs> that the, that he came to Phil Jackson in the middle of the season and goes, I need a vacation. Yeah. I need to get away. And so uh, Phil gave him 48 hours to go to Vegas. And <laughs> Michael's going, he ain't coming back. He's, he's not coming back in 48 hours. Yeah. And there's videos of him partying in Vegas and, and doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and I think it was maybe three days later, Michael Jordan had to go to Vegas to get him yeah. and pulled him out of a hotel room with a famous, famous woman uh, in the room with him uh, yeah. and, and bring him back to <laughs> bring him back to Chicago. Yeah. That's uh, <clears throat> that's not, uh, that's not surprising if you know anything much about Dennis Rodman in terms of his backstory there, but yeah, he's uh but he was a key piece of, of that second three-peat when it comes to um, what the Bulls did there. So, also, also the stories of Phil Jackson. I, so oh, his I, background, I, you mean? Oh, yeah. That was yeah. fascinating. So the dude, <laughs> the dude played for the Knicks, won a couple championships, published a book talking about uh, doing drugs, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then goes and coaches in the Puerto Rican League, which I didn't realize there was a Puerto Rican League. <laughs> And these towns would get so passionate at their basketball that the mayor came out and shot one of the referees yeah. in the middle of a game because he didn't <laughs> like a call. And his only punishment was that he couldn't come to the game uh, for, yes. for a week or a month or something like that. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> well, and then um, it, I, I didn't know this. Um, he grew up in a religious family. His, I did his, find that interesting. His yeah. parents, uh, his dad was a pastor and... I thought was his mom, was she actually a pastor as well? Or I maybe he said my mom was a minister, a minister. Okay. And, um, you know, talked about how he was raised in an environment where there was a huge emphasis on the return of Christ. And, um, and then his sort of his journey a little bit, they didn't tell a whole lot of it, but, uh, his interest because of where he grew up in Montana, um, his interest in native American spirituality. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was, it was, I, you know, that was just a brief moment of, of the, uh, of the episode, but man, I could, he I could hear a two hour episode about that. I I'd love to hear about Phil Jackson's religious upbringing. You know, I think that'd be fascinating. 
Well, he's, yeah, he's well known for his uh, implementation of um, sort of Buddhist, Zen Buddhist practices with his, within his coaching. And, but I didn't know the, the last dance pointed out that there's also uh, an emphasis that he uh, incorporated specifically incorporated native American spirituality within uh, his, his coaching. Yeah. Oh, it was, I would love to hear more about that. I, f- I thought that was fascinating and, and interesting. Um, but yeah. Okay. So that was episode three. Episode four was really more about um, the rise, eventually getting to that first championship uh, that they yes. had. And having and they, to get past the Pistons. Yeah. And, uh, and ESPN came out with a 30 for 30 on the, on the, the bad boys. Yeah, um, that was their nickname as a team. Yeah, four or five years ago, probably. And so I knew a number of the things that they talked about there. Um, yes, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I learned anything new in that, other than it was fun to hear Isaiah talk about walking off the court with seven seconds left and Michael Jordan upset about the lack of sportsmanship. Yeah, um, yeah, that wasn't. Uh, that wasn't surprising to try to hear Isaiah Thomas defend that. And I, uh, I think that um, it was just totally classless, but here's the thing. It totally fit with the Pistons and their sort of uh, uh, aura, their, their sort of team image of being the bad boys. Yeah. And, you know, it, it really is like, you think about this, they were the bullies on the block. And so, once the bullies were finally dethroned, so to speak, they just walked away, right? There's no like, well, we were beaten by a better team tonight and, you know, congratulations to them. It was just sort of a classic bully move of, I'm just going to take my ball and go home and I'm not going to talk to you. Um, but it just reminded me how, how much uh, I, I could not stand Bill Beer. Oh my goodness, was he a dirty player. Yeah. And I don't think he was a particularly good player. He was smart, I think, but he was, he was just very physical, right? Uh, he could, he was a decent three point shooter. And, this, and again, okay. this is before the era uh, of this current era where everybody shoots the three. So he was sort of a, uh, he, he was maybe a stretch four hmm. before there was such a thing as a stretch four. Not that he could really attack the basket, but he could, he could stand outside the three point line and stretch the defense and then bang around inside. Um, but when you see some of the ways they fouled Jordan, when he went to the rim, like today, there wouldn't be any players left on the team. They, they, they'd all be suspended for the, yeah. the dirty shots that they, they took at Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they talked about that a lot. And I, I think there's a part of me that longs for not that physical, but, but a little bit more physical, um, NBA, you know, where, where there are some, there are some harder fouls, but nothing like, nothing like what the bad boys were doing, uh, back then. Yeah. I, I don't know though. Uh, Yes. And no, I think some of the ways that they officiate the games today in terms of contact where you're like, that's a flagrant foul. Come on, give Mm -hmm. me a break. But, um, I also, I don't want to go back to the era of the, uh, no offense, the, the Knicks in the heat where it's like, this is yeah. basically a street fight organized around a basketball. Yeah. And that was, I mean, I, I saw an interview with, I can't remember who, but, uh, but they were saying like, yeah, basically the Knicks of the nineties and the heat also just took the, took the Pistons blueprint and tried to make that work. Yeah. Um, and it, it didn't work, obviously didn't work for them. Well, it worked enough to make them good, but not championship level. Sure. But it's just that's just also not um, to me. That's not an entertaining brand of basketball. I, 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 you know, I I just don't enjoy that to the level of you know a little bit more freedom of movement uh, and that sort of thing. Now I I do think that they could call things a little tighter at points in today's NBA and uh, in terms of freedom of movement, but also maybe dial back on some of the like really that's a flagrant. Uh, I don't think that's really a flagrant kind of thing, but. Yeah, which is which is kind of the opposite of what the Bulls did. The Bulls they talked about last night had just so much movement going around. Yeah, um, and I didn't realize that somebody else came up with that. Like I thought Phil Jackson was such a proponent of the triangle. Ah, uh, Tex Winter. He was. I didn't guru. realize that. I didn't realize that. So that that was very cool. But 
I think it's time to move on to our next topic, uh, which if, if you're not a sports fan, thank you for putting up with us. Can I just uh, say one more thing? I, I, absolutely. One of my favorite moments, I think this was episode four when they, uh, when they had finally beaten the Pistons to move on to the NBA finals, um, was seeing Jerry Krause dance on the airplane. Yes. <laughs> just a short fat white man dancing in the midst of all of these like elite athletic black men who are yes. like, you know, obviously very gifted and fluid in their movements. And, you know, there's this short white fat man who's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that, but you're right. That was so good to see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was great. Anyway. It was fantastic. I, I don't know that there's any suitable transition to our next topic. So next topic yeah yeah uh and our our next topic really comes from um something that we've been watching unfold over the past uh probably week week and a half um and there's been articles that have gone back and forth back and forth uh and it all really stems uh from a talk that was given by uh greg gilbert at together for the gospel about what the gospel is uh and his argument was uh, that the gospel is uh, justification by faith, uh, atonement, um, and his sparring partners, I would say, have been Scott McKnight and Matthew Bates. And their argument is the gospel is the kingdom of God, um, more or less. And so they both they both have books and they both deal with one another in their books, although I think Greg Gilbert's book is the oldest. Um, yeah, and that's then, correct. Yeah. And they have articles that are going back and forth, um, no and and so they 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 keep interacting. So, uh, Doc, if you could maybe for us just just succinctly put together, uh, what what are the two signs of this? What are some benefits of each, and and maybe where do you fall? Yeah. So I think that uh, this the starting point in in one sense is to go back to Greg Gilbert's book, uh, What is the Gospel, which I think was published in two thousand ten, maybe somewhere around there. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, which uh, is a very straightforward, simple presentation of the gospel message um, within its uh, sort of larger biblical theological framework. It's a short book. It's intended as a uh, straightforward presentation sort of along the kind of traditional uh, God, man, Christ response framework of understanding the gospel. And, um, you know, in, in that sense, there, there was really nothing that was uh, earth shattering or paradigm shifting in that book. It was just a sort of restatement of a very traditional understanding of what the gospel is from an evangelical perspective, though certainly from a more, um, Calvinistic framework, a more reformed framework, but it, it wasn't heavy handed reformed. It wasn't something sure. that if you're not reformed, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is just so, this is just Calvinism. This is not the gospel kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I remember reading that book either when I was in college or shortly after college. I remember finding it um, immensely helpful. And, yeah. and I've, I've always been grateful to Greg Gilbert for that book. Yeah. So um, probably within the last, um, I want to say within the last five years is when some of this really started to, th this uh, debate really started to take more shape. When um, Scott McKnight, who's a professor at uh, North Park Seminary in, um, in Chicago area, wrote a book called The King Jesus Gospel. And really what he tried to contend is that um, that sort of more traditional framework of presenting the gospel as God, man, Christ response with uh, a heavy emphasis on things like justification is a, uh, is, is at best a distorted version of what the gospel actually is. And his emphasis was much more on what you find in the gospels in terms of Jesus announcement of the kingdom of God. And, and he would summarize what the gospel is as essentially the gospel, the good news, is the announcement that Jesus is king. Hmm. It's, it's the fact that Jesus is king and he is ushering in a kingdom. And um, as a sort of contributing uh, voice to this, although 
he would have some different nuances. Matthew Bates, uh, another uh, professor, I forget where he teaches at, but uh, Matthew Bates wrote a book, um, or actually wrote two. One was called Salvation by Allegiance Alone, and then Gospel Allegiance. So you notice even in those titles, he's sort of redefining faith as allegiance, uh, yeah. so sort of broaden it out beyond just sort of simple trust. And uh, Bates makes statements in, in, in his writings along to, to the effect of things like uh, justification by faith is not the gospel. So not just it's not central to the gospel, that it's not the gospel. And trying to emphasize, again, the, uh, the proclamation of the gospel is the announcement that Jesus is king. He's ushering in a kingdom. And all of those other things, like justification by faith, are not actually part of the gospel. They're made more like uh, entailments, um, outworkings, benefits. Those are some of the, the terms that are used by both uh, Bates and by Scott McKnight uh, in their in their writings to sort of uh, articulate this. And so in in um, Greg Gilbert's T4G message, he directly responds to both McKnight and Bates and tries to situate what he says as a sort of, well, um, yes, but not really kind of framework in saying, they make some good points about this, but these statements are problematic. And of course, that's what has sparked both McKnight and Matthew Bates to respond. And Matthew Bates and Scott McKnight have both written responses in Christianity Today uh, that we'll link in the show notes that you can read. Um, and I don't know about you, but as, as I've read through them, I, I, I personally, and I, I haven't read too much Scott McKnight or Matthew Bates uh, particularly. Um, Ma uh, Scott McKnight's response I uh, appreciate, I don't always agree with. Um, Matthew Bates, I find, is a little, uh, almost like the little brother of the situation that's just trying to agitate his older brother at times and, and just feels overly aggressive in some of his statements. Does, is, is that how you're reading them as well? Is that? Yeah, I think that there is definitely, um, uh, there's there's a there's an element of talking past each other and um again i think my sympathies lie far more on the greg gilbert side of things in terms of understanding the gospel at the core at the irreducible core as uh being able to be summarized in that sort of god uh man christ response framework but also recognizing that um, that that irreducible core only makes sense within the larger narrative framework of Jesus' identity and what he does within the larger story of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I do feel like there's talking past each other. And Greg Gilbert actually wrote a response to those responses, which I found super helpful, because one of the things that he does is he points out some of the uh, just ambiguity of the language used by guys like Scott McKnight and Matthew Bates in terms of, well, on the one hand, you're saying justification by faith is not the gospel. And then other points you're saying, well, but it's an entailment of the gospel or like, like just some of the language is not always as precise as it could be when it comes to uh, those things. But it, really, this is, this is the most current expression of a, of a much more, um, of a much older debate mm -hmm. in the sense that um, there's often been this debate within biblical scholarship of what is the relationship between Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God in the Gospels and Paul's uh, presentation of justification by faith? Because it, it can feel like, at a surface level, very different um, presentations of what is the good news. And so this is just the most recent expression of that much older issue that's been going on for a while. Yeah. Um, what, where do you fall in this, in this conversation? Uh, I, I think you've already made me tipped your hand a little bit, but maybe a more, more clear declaration. Where, where, where do you fall, uh, in this, uh, in this debate? Well, I think that when it comes to understanding the gospel, I do think there is that sort of irreducible core that um, that sort of God-man-Christ response 
is a faithful understanding of what the gospel is, but it's difficult to make sense of it unless it's in the larger storyline of the Bible, mm-hmm. especially in a, in a culture where the, the larger sort of Judeo-Christian framework is largely fading from our broader cultural awareness, right? And so if you look at that sort of traditional presentation of God, man, Christ response, you know, sort of typified by the classic four spiritual laws, right? Mm -hmm. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Man is sinful and fallen short of the glory of God. Christ died for sins to pay the penalty for our sins. Now you just need to respond in faith and trust in him. Well, Every sentence I just said has assumptions built into it, right? Who is God? What is God like? What, how has God revealed himself? And all of that today probably needs to be at some level unpacked because you can't, in many contexts, just say the word God and assume that people have the Judeo-Christian God in mind. Sure. And, and the same goes for those other pieces as well. However, I think that um, when you when you focus too much on the sort of larger narrative framework of Jesus is King, and don't talk specifically about what is it that he does to what does he does what does he do as the King? His death accomplishes things, and part of what his death accomplishes is making sinners right with God. Well, right there is justification. And I just think it's irresponsible, quite frankly, to make statements like, well, justification is not the gospel. Well, that's hard to, hard to square with texts in Galatians, for example, where in the heart of what Paul is doing there, he says things like, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then two verses later, he talks about how God preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So clearly there's this very tight relationship between uh, the gospel and justification by faith. And so I think that it is irresponsible to say uh, justification by faith is not the gospel. And I do think that justification by faith is in some sense at the heart of or central to the gospel in the sense that a human being who is sinful being declared right with God is at the heart of what Jesus has done. Now, it's bigger than that. There's more to the gospel than that, I think. But I think it's irresponsible to say some of the things that both McKnight and uh, Barrett say when it comes to, you know, these sort of bold declarations of justification by faith is not the gospel. Those kind of things. And and I I think I've heard you describe it this way. So I'm stealing this from you just to cite my source. Uh, but the gospel has has a I'm I'm going to butcher the photography terms, but a but a a, a, cl- a close up view, which would be the you know justification by faith, kind of kind of zooming in there, um, and then also a panorama view or or a, or a wide angle, uh, which is the the overarching story uh, of Jesus being enthroned. Um, like like both those things, we can't have this false dichotomy that seems to be emerging from this. Uh, from this debate. And, you know, these are two things that, that work together, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I think, and in fairness, I think what McKnight and Bates are responding to is a certain way of talking about the gospel that is very um, sort of that zoom lens in to the, to the center, the sort of 1 Corinthians 15 piece of Christ died for our sins, he was buried, was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, etc., and not even realizing that in that late in that same chapter in First Corinthians fifteen, that that little uh, core is embedded in a larger story about Jesus having dominion over all creation as the mm-hmm. last Adam, yeah, and that being demonstrated by his resurrection and the future sort of new creation that he's going to reign over, and so even it's it's, it's an example of. Let's let's not sort of split things apart that are intended to be together. Let's let's keep both in view. So in the sense that you have Bates and McKnight offering a critique in that direction, I think their critique is appropriate for a certain chunk of people, but not someone like a Greg Gilbert who is very um, 
clear in his integrating of the core of the gospel message to the larger biblical narrative. Yeah, that's a good word. And I'm sure we could say uh, uh, so much more about this and keep going. Uh, but frankly, we're busy people, uh, even in the midst of a pandemic here. And we've got stuff to do. So, uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's move on to our athlete. Uh, okay. Doc, who... Uh, let, me, let me just say real quick, we will put okay. some links in the show notes. Absolutely, absolutely. If you want to pursue this issue a little bit further, both from uh, Greg Gilbert, Matthew Bates, Scott McKnight, even uh, Michael Bird and N.T. Wright, some, some things in there that if you want to pursue this a little bit further. So uh, look to the show notes for that and uh, you can yeah. do, dig a little bit deeper on your own. And, and we'll put those in the Facebook, uh, the Facebook uh, page as well. So if people want to read and uh, we, we encourage reading, we're big fans. We're uh, pro reading, yes. We're pro reading, not pro readers, but we are pro reading. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's move on to our athlete uh, for the week. Uh, so we are at, what are we at, 17 here? Yeah. So, so who do we got for 17? You want to walk us through um, sort of our... Uh, for, some some main people we think of. Well, yeah, I'm going to be honest. I, I feel like we're, uh, our, we're the number seventeen is a little bit of slim pickings in my in my mind hmm. uh, compared to to other numbers that we've encountered so far. So we've got uh, on the NFL front, we've got Philip Rivers. Okay. Uh, recently. Uh, just signed by the Colts, right? Yeah, right? yeah. One of the odd, uh, just a strange looking throwing motion. Looks like he's throwing a shot put every time he throws the yeah. football. Yeah. And he's got like, what, 35 kids or something like that? Or, or... Yeah, yeah. I think married his, uh, his high school sweetheart. I think they're they're like very Catholic. And, yeah, so. You know, just having, just pumping them out. Yeah, I think eight or nine. But if, you know, in today's world, that feels like 35, right? So. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard, I've heard him do interviews where he wants a few more. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Uh, the other one, uh, this is a little off the radar, okay? Yeah, not... Steve DeBerg was a quarterback, a journeyman quarterback throughout his NFL career, played for the Tampa Bay Bucks, played for the, um, the Kansas City Chiefs. He was your classic journeyman quarterback throughout what, his NFL career. What era was he in? What year? Uh, this would have been in the 80s. Okay, so he was like the Ryan Fitzpatrick or the Josh McCown of, yeah. of the 80s. But he stuck around forever. And so um, I, I don't envision us selecting him, but the fact that he was a journeyman quarterback that wore number 17. It's a good nod. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I agree. Uh, John Havlicek, moving on to the NBA. Uh, Celtics legend from the uh, dynasty in the 1960s and uh, also an Ohio State alum so he was part of ohio state's um dominant uh teams in the 60s as well there staying in the nba two more here chris mullen a lefty sharpshooter member of the uh dream team yeah st john's standout yeah st john's yeah. coach for a bit as well and played for uh golden state yeah for that's right a, a long chunk there in fact um if 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 our listeners are old enough to remember the the video game NBA Jam, he was. I, I a, think uh, yeah, I think people know that game. Like I think it's I think it's uh, uh, classic enough that I think. And people I, just I imagine it. too that on uh, on two K on NBA two K you can probably play with some legends that Chris Mullen is on there, left handed sharpshooter. And then this is more of a local nod here in our uh, home area of Warsaw and Winona Lake, Rick Fox. Yeah, grew up, grew up, and or uh, came to Warsaw. I think from the. Did he come from the Caribbean? Where, where I think did he, that's where he, right. Yeah, and uh, and the rumor was, I don't know if this is true or not, but that he wanted to come play at Grace College, where where uh, you and I both work. Yeah, and uh, you know we're a very very small school, and our coach rumor has I don't know how true this is said to him, you need to go to North Carolina. You know, <laughs> you, you, you need to go to a big time program. So. And, you know, went on to win NBA championships with the, with the LA Lakers. And has become something of a, of a celebrity, celebrity outside of basketball, yeah? Yeah, I believe, I remember watching uh, at least one episode of uh, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader or a Third Grader, or whatever that TV show is. And, uh, and he was hosting. He was, uh, he, was, he was doing his work. A couple of nods to um, Ohio State players. Todd Beckman who was a very ordinary quarterback in the 
<clears throat> early 2000s or mid, sorry, mid to late 2000s. Um, and then Jalen Marshall, someone that yeah, we can both up get on board with. Yeah. <laughs> wide receiver for Ohio State, punt returner, and uh, played in the NFL with the Jets. Yeah, the Jets really liked him. He just could never get his act together. You know, it'd be one spectacular play and then one uh, knuckleheaded play, usually. Yes. <clears throat> he was one of uh, Nate from Ohio's least favorite Ohio State players. So hmm. shout out to him. All right. So, who are we going with? Doc, who do you like? So I. I, we've, we've moved away from current players. So I'll take Philip Rivers off. Uh, and as much as I would like a nod to, to Steve uh, DeBerg, I'm going to remove <laughs> him as well. Okay. So that leaves us with Havlicek, Mullen, and Fox. Okay. I, I don't have a, I don't feel like I have a dog in the fight. Um, my, uh, I'm not a fan of the Celtics. Uh, though the fact that John Havlicek is a Buckeye makes me uh, a little bit more inclined towards him. But um, you know, Rick Fox being a local product here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I also know you're kind of partial to Chris Mullen. So I, I'm, happy yeah. to, uh, I'm happy to defer to you. You know what? Let's name the episode after Rick Fox. Okay. A little nod to Warsaw. Okay. We can do that. Rick Fox. All right. So one thing you liked this week, John. Yeah. So um, I was uh, uh, scurrying around the internet as one does uh, and, uh, and came across uh, a church in London, All Souls Church. Um, and they have uh, sermons dating back to the, to the 70s, um, including a number of John Stott sermons. Uh, hundreds of them. And so I've been, I've been going through and just on my lunch break, listening to John Stott sermons. Uh, and they are, they are fantastic. I love the way John Stott thinks. I, I've, I've always appreciated him. I've always appreciated his writing. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the Cross of Christ is, is a classic that's, that's near and dear to me. Uh, but yeah, All Souls Church, uh, uh, and I'll put a link for that in the show notes. We're going to have a lot of links in the show notes. <laughs> Um, but to, to some of those sermons, really, really, really solid stuff. How about yourself? Yeah, so I'm going to go with, um, and even as I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm wondering if I've already mentioned this in a previous episode. I hope I haven't. Um, maybe, maybe this was during our uh, practice episodes back yeah, the, in the archive that never that, saw that the will, light of day. That will never see the light of day. But yes, uh, I, think they, I think this was there. I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe in like twenty years, when um, when ESPN wants to do a uh, a, a a ten part series on the uh, on the podcast here, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll get permission to dig into the archives. Yeah, we can release those episodes eventually after some some people we've talked about and some of those episodes pass away. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, my uh, my one thing I like this week is a podcast. That has a fabulous name. I'm 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 jealous of this name. It's Food Trucks in Babylon, which is a mm -hmm. great name for a podcast. It is a great name. So this is a podcast that's uh, put together by Patrick Schreiner and Todd Mills, who are professors at Western Seminary, and they tackle a number of biblical and theological topics. They just had a uh, recent set of episodes on uh, seeing Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, I think one of their first episodes was on a biblical perspective on marijuana. So, you know, an, an issue that really, a, m I think most Christians and pastors and others have not put a ton of thought into. And it's not just them sort of shooting from the hip. They actually had a, uh, some, some medical experts on that episode to talk oh, wow. about what does marijuana do to you? How is it different from what alcohol does to you or what caffeine does to you? And um, so it was, it was really well done. So that's food trucks in Babylon by uh, hosted by Patrick Schreiner and Todd. Mills. And, and they're in uh, they're in uh, Oregon, right? Uh, so they're out West. So probably, probably marijuana and, and food trucks are probably a little bit more prevalent. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a little bit more like Babylon. Uh, than, uh, <laughs> there you go. Than, than more so in Italy. Yeah, yeah. Th they are based in Portland there. So, um, but uh, although there's yeah. a fantastic bakery in Portland, yes, uh, that I would love to go to. 
uh, Slow Rise Craft Breads by Dave Ferrier. Um, yes. I, I've never had any of the bread because I've never been to Portland, but uh, he's a he's a uh, former classmate of mine, former student of yours. Uh, that that we would we would love to go to that bakery and a listener as well. Yes. Well, he 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 made bread here before he moved out to uh, to the Oregon area, and uh, he had his own little sort of side hustle almost where he would make personalized, um, you know, he'd make a a, a bread a different type of bread each week. And you were one of his uh, subscribers, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. I would go to his house every Tuesday or something like that with like 10 bucks and knock on the door. He would come out and hand me this, you know, this this loaf wrapped in butcher paper and with a little yeah. twine around it. And he'd hand it to me and it had my name on it. And he'd go, man, I was just reading some Tolkien. It was, it was delightful. I need to get back to it. Sorry, I got to go. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. So shout out to uh, Dave in Oregon there. But so I think it's time to declare mission accomplished. Wouldn't you agree? We've, we've done it. Yeah, we've, I, th- we've I think we've, we've, we've checked the box here. So we have addressed our various and sundry topics. And so all that's left to say at this point is the Lord bless y'all real good. Later. <laughs> <laughs>